Hello and welcome to Granada Reports, live with the latest across the northwest. Welcome to a brand new week on the programme this evening. No deal struck ahead of NHS strikes, meaning more walkouts across the northwest. NHS staff voice their frustration. They've got to involve us in those discussions and they've got to listen to what we're saying. Banks will now lend on flats with dangerous cladding, but residents tell us they still feel stuck in unsellable homes. Actor Will Meller on the nightmare of having his identity stolen after scammers took mail out of his letterbox. Just to be aware um, of what's going on and that these people are one step ahead, so just to try and be as careful as you can. And it's felt cold today, but there's been enough blue in the sky to make a sailor a pair of trousers. All change for tomorrow. The forecast is coming up. Well, first tonight, and NHS strikes are set to go ahead as today's talks ended with no deal. It means staff at Northwest Ambulance Service will walk out as planned on Wednesday, and nurses across Merseyside will strike next week. Yeah, it spells more disruption for the health service in our region, which is buckling under the backlog. At the Royal Liverpool Hospital, staff have written a damning letter to trust executives, voicing their concerns about a steep decline in care standards since the new hospital opened in October. And at one GP practice today, one doctor with 30 years' experience told us staff are under unprecedented pressure and need the government to listen. Tim Scott has this report. <laughs> We've had strikes by our nurses and ambulance workers in recent weeks and next it could be our junior doctors. The British Medical Association is balloting 45,000 of them over whether to strike over pay in March. The pressures on our hospitals were highlighted in a letter from the emergency department staff at the Royal Liverpool Hospital sent to management in November but leaked last week. In it they described the new hospital building as overcrowded, chaotic and unpleasant and they said they are embarrassed, ashamed and demoralised by the standard of care they're currently providing. In response management said they have made progress since the letter was delivered but recognise more needs to be done and today we heard from Rob Barnett a Liverpool GP about the difficulties being faced in doctor's surgeries who he said are also short-staffed and oversubscribed. We've been stretched and in fact overstretched for very very many months you know we talk about winter pressures we've got all-round pressures we had no lull in the summer and the workload that we're having to deal with at the moment actually is almost unprecedented. What kind of effect does all this have on you, yourself and your colleagues? There comes a point when you can't cope. So we try working as hard as we can. We try and meet the demand that comes through from patients, whether that's face-to-face -face demand, whether it's on the telephone demand, whether it's emails. But actually, we're exhausted. Do you believe then that the government perhaps accept that there is a crisis but just won't or can't say that in public? They must see what's being said in the press. They must see for themselves what's happening in the hospitals. The fact is, I think, that for them to declare it's a crisis would mean that they've got to declare the fact that they've failed. Meanwhile, in Parliament this afternoon, Health Secretary Stephen Barclay outlined measures which he said would relieve some of the pressure on our hospitals. We will block book beds in residential homes to enable around 2,500 people to be released from hospitals where they are medically fit to be discharged. When combined with the ramping up of the 500 million discharge funding, uh, it will unblock, uh, which will unblock an estimated one to 2,000 delayed discharge cases, capacity on wards will be freed up, which in turn enables those patients admitted by emergency departments to move to wards which in turn unblocks ambulance delays. Talks between the NHS unions and government did take place today, but with no deal struck that would avert further strike action, it seems the crisis in our GPs, surgeries and hospitals looks set to continue. Tim Scott, ITV News.
Well, we're joined now by Stephanie Dunn, the North West Regional Director for the Royal College of Nurses. Stephanie, what's your reaction to today's talks? Disappointed. Um, this was a real opportunity for the Secretary of State for Health to sit down with nursing union leaders and have a conversation, start the negotiation. It's a failure to acknowledge that there's a genuine dispute where nurses have got another year of below inflation pay rise on the table and expected to just accept it. You know, 10, 12 years of underfunding has led to a 20% deficit in people's pay packets and their pensions when they ultimately retire. So their families are struggling, they are struggling, and buying extra beds in hospital, does not in care homes, I'm sorry, does not address the workforce crisis. We've got over 40,000 vacancies. We're currently continuing to recruit nurses from overseas and um, to plug the gaps that we have. And if you buy extra beds in care homes, you might as well just buy sticks of furniture because largely those beds unnursed are just furniture. It's we definitely... need nurses in those jobs. Yeah, it's Stephanie, with all of that in mind, um, how do you feel about the fact uh, that nurses across Merseyside will now be heading back to the picket line uh, rather than heading into work? I think, along with our members, disappointed and saddened. You know, we had hoped that after repeated requests from the chief executive of the RCN that the, Mr Barclay would sit down and start to have, you know, a professional um, dialogue that acknowledges the problem so it's sad for our members that we have to go through this. It's sad for the public that they have to continue to struggle to access safe and effective care. But we know we are determined to fight for, for our members, at, but also to have the right number of staff properly uh, remunerated. Stephanie, you know, there are reports today that government suggested a, a one-off payment. What, what would settle the dispute for you? Well, I'd... I uh, would have to go with what the chief exec is able to negotiate and what our members would then be prepared to accept. Um, you know, my thoughts are pretty much immaterial here. It's about recognising the unfairness of the system, listening to the previous package that you had where the GP is describing the exhaustion um, and a failure to recognise that nurses and doctors and other clinical staff are people too with human needs and many of them are stressed and broken and um, this is just adding to their distress. Okay. Uh, Stephanie Dunn, the North West Regional Director for the Royal College of Nurses, uh, thank you very much for joining us um, once again. Thank you. Thank you. Well, next tonight, the residents trapped in unsellable homes because of dangerous cladding who say they're no closer to a resolution despite the fact that six major banks started lending on some of them from today. Yeah, banks stopped lending on flats with cladding issues or safety defects after the Grenfell Tower fire in 2017. But flat owners in Manchester have been telling our correspondent Rob Smith that eye-watering insurance costs and the prospect of lengthy building works may mean no one wants to buy their homes. We're in the same position we were yesterday and same position we'll be in tomorrow. A mortgage advisor who doesn't believe anyone will want a mortgage on his home. Michael McClatchy's apartment block design house in Manchester needs recladding to install fire protections. In the wake of Grenfell, mortgages were impossible or hard to come by. His young family's long needed more space and peace of mind. Now six big banks say they'll lend on medium and high-rise flats with cladding. But Michael's not convinced there's any point looking for a buyer just yet. Who wants to move into a property that's going to be a potential building site for? Um, I'm, I've seen estimates from six months to two years for some of the works and buildings around the town. There's, there's many reasons not to buy it. There's not too many reasons to buy it at the moment unless they're getting a heavily discounted price. The price of buildings insurance on blocks with issues is the worry for one couple from Compass Point in the city's Bagley neighbourhood. They're paying £5,000 per year now. Flat owners elsewhere are paying thousands too. Joe Davis says it puts off buyers. Renting out her home was the only option. She believes lenders and government ministers should be tackling insurance costs at the same time. They need to really focus on the stuff that's halting people who want to buy a flat 
um, in actually being interested in buying a flat because there's just no point um, if they've got all these extra costs that is nobody's fault. Groups dedicated to helping those living with cladding say mortgage changes are positive but not everyone's covered. We're cautiously optimistic that it will help some people but there's still too many people trapped through issues they never played no part in causing. There's still a range of problems. People in buildings under 11 metres aren't getting any help, so it's a very complicated issue. It'll take a long time to sort it out. We've made some progress, but we're nowhere near the end of it. Tonight, the Department for Leveling Up told us. It is welcome that lenders will now consider mortgage applications in buildings over 11 metres with cladding in England that may previously have been refused. This is possible because of the protections for leaseholders in the Building Safety Act and our commitment to getting buildings fixed, whether through our own remediation schemes or as a result of the pledge from developers. Lenders have confirmed that this will help to get the property market moving again by helping buyers and innocent leaseholders who have been stuck for too long to sell their homes. Sales, some worry, could still take years. Rob Smith, ITV News. On to more of the day's news now and an inquest into the death of a young woman who was being cared for at the Priory Psychiatric Unit in Cheadle has heard she'd taken a lethal chemical she bought on the internet. The hearing in Stockport was told Beth Matthews, who was 26, had a history of mental health issues. The jury was told she suffered life-changing injuries after jumping off a bridge near where she used to live in Cornwall. The inquest is expected to last six days. A number of Hillsborough survivors and families have raised concerns after reports of fan congestion during this weekend's game between Sheffield Wednesday and Newcastle. The FA plan to speak to officials from both clubs with cl claims that fans were forced to rip out security screening around the tunnel in the Leppings Lane end. West Derby MP Ian Burns says the situation urgently needs looking at. Staggering, things haven't improved, but obviously being a Hillsborough, the FA Cup, you know, you just you just never for one minute thought that you'd see them scenes again. And then obviously looking at some of the comments from the Newcastle fans and what the experience that was it was, it was soul chilling and I'm sure thousands and thousands of people who were at Hillsborough that day in nineteen eighty nine felt exactly the same, families and survivors. And pet dogs are said to be allowed on trams in Greater Manchester after a pilot last summer was deemed to have been a success. Passengers are restricted to having a maximum of two dogs that are properly controlled on a lead or wearing a muzzle if necessary. Uh, right, there's uh, lots more coming up on the programme, including... A catch-up with netballer Jade Clark after she was named in the New Year's Honours list. And while the puddles are fun for some of us, over the next few days we're expecting quite a good deal of rain. There'll be some difficult driving conditions and we have a weather warning in place in the forecast. I'll have all the details a little later on. And here's what's still to come on the ITV News at 6.30 with Charlene. Coming up, Prince Harry takes aim at Camilla in a fresh round of TV interviews. After accusing the Queen Consort of leaking stories on ITV last night, he's now called Camilla a villain with a dangerous relationship with the press. We have all the reaction. Also ahead, no end in sight for the strikes, the latest on talks between the unions and the government. Plus, eyes to the skies, why Cornwall is set to make European space history tonight. Join us for all that and more from 6.30. Well, next tonight, in Stockport, actor Will Meller has revealed he was the victim of fraudsters who stole his identity. And the Strictly Come Dancing star revealed the scammers took a substantial amount of money and set up various bank accounts to launder cash. He's now warning that it could happen to anyone and chatted to us a short time ago to tell people what to look out for. It was, it was a strange one. Um, my neighbour, uh, she, she bumped into me and she said, I just wanted to speak to you. I, I think I've seen somebody hanging around your, your letterbox, and I think I saw him take something out of it. And I went, are you sure? I said, yeah. So and my letterbox is at the bottom of my drive, so it's not like they were near my front door or anything. So, so I put um, my CCTV camera face, facing towards the letterbox uh, to see if I could catch anything. And uh, lo and behold, um, I caught a guy uh, with his hand in my letterbox taking mail out um, and stealing stuff from my mail. Um, so I went and met my, um, my postman next time he came round. I said, have you seen a guy following you around or anywhere near you? He went, yeah, they have, and he's there behind you. 
Uh, and I set off towards him and he saw me and he turned around and drove off at speed and I took a picture of his reg. Um, and then through that, I found out that he'd been intercepting my mail because he'd opened several accounts in my name and he'd, he'd stole my identity and he, he'd been laundering money through accounts and one of them had £20,000 in it. Yeah, weird and scary to think how many people also find themselves in this uh, situation. Just looking at this uh, research that's um, come out, um, one in five people are targeted. Yeah, yeah, the research is done by Nationwide. They're trying to bring attention to people that, you know, just keep an eye on what you're doing. It's like 70% of people share personal details on social media. Just be careful what you're posting and what you're putting on your bios. And also, um, knowing what's happened to me now, I... I go through my bank statements every day now. It's just because I'm paranoid. I mean, you've given us a, a, a few ideas there of, of how we can sort of protect ourselves. But have you got any sort of, you know, more top tips of what we can do to try and stop this happening? Um, well, my wife actually got me this wallet for Christmas. Um, it looks just like any old wallet. But what it's got, this has got in it is it prevents people from using the contactless um, mechanism which they, they can steal money off your car just by being close to your wallet and it's great because it just means when I'm on the train I used to be looking around at people going why is it so close I'm paranoid now after once it's happened to me it is it's really scary isn't it um will just just briefly what, what are you up to next I'm on the Strictly tour with a start rehearsal tomorrow I've done the hard bit the hard bit was doing Strictly the nerve-wracking bit dancing in front of 10 million people live on TV every Saturday night so Hopefully this I can have a bit more fun with it and enjoy it and not be so terrified every time I dance. Yeah, the very best of luck with it, Will. Um, thanks very much for joining us today and, um, and thanks very much for those top tips of yours. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, time for sport now. And 12 North West teams played in the FA Cup over the weekend. And I believe it was a good weekend for, uh, for many of them, Mike. It was indeed, Mel. Of those 12, as many as 10 made it into the draw for round four. Among them were Blackpool, who pulled off one of the weekend shocks by beating Premier League Nottingham Forest. Their reward is another top flight side. They're off to Southampton next. Elsewhere, Preston North End have a mouth-watering home tie against Tottenham Hotspur. Fleetwood are in the fourth round for the first time in their history. They play Sheffield Wednesday and Manchester City could face Arsenal, who play Oxford in round three tonight. Well, City cruised into round four thanks to a comfortable 4-0 win at home to Chelsea. Manchester United are also through. They beat Everton 3-1 on Friday night. Jack Vale made Norwich City pay for this defensive mix-up. He scored the only goal of the game as Blackburn Rovers won 1-0 at Carrow Road. Preston fought back from a goal down to win 3-1 at home to Huddersfield. Liverpool, Wigan and Accrington all drew their games and faced replays, while there were a few cup shocks. Burnley, who can't put a foot wrong at the moment, beat Premier League Bournemouth by four goals to two. Another of our championship clubs, Blackpool, thrashed Nottingham Forest 4-1 at Bloomfield Road. And League One, Fleetwood Town, beat championship side QPR 2-1 to make round four for the first time. It's the intensity from the start, the willingness and the desire of the lads as well. And what they do week to week, they're getting fitter, they're getting stronger, and they want to get better. And for me, I, I couldn't work with a better bunch of lads. Well, the Cup meant just a handful of games were played in the Football League, but there were some important results. Salford City returned to the League Two playoff places with their 2-1 win against Northampton. Barrow are just above them in sixth spot in the table after their 3-2 victory away at Mansfield. They were 2-0 down. Rochdale remain in the bottom two after their one-all draw with Newport County. Tramir Rovers also had to settle for a point. They drew 2-2 with Sutton United. In League One, Morecambe climbed out of the relegation zone thanks to their 2-1 victory at home to Cheltenham. Elsewhere, Bolton played out a goalless draw with Plymouth. To Rugby Union, and it was another good weekend for Sale Sharks. They cemented their place in the Premiership's top two with a 24 points to 16 victory away at Harlequins. The result means the Sharks are nine points behind leaders Saracens, but now 12 points clear of Quinns, who are third. And the Cheshire Phoenix extended their winning run to three games in the British Basketball League as they secured a 101 points to 82 victory over the Plymouth City Patriots. 
Giants. Manchester Giants were beaten by Bristol Flyers. Well, next we turn to netball and it is a World Cup year for England's Roses and they are starting their warm-up in Manchester. On Wednesday they take on Commonwealth silver medalist Jamaica at the AO Arena. Another special moment for Partington's Jade Clark playing in her home city just a couple of weeks after being named in the New Year's Honours list. Chris Hall has been to meet her. With 195 appearances, Jade Clark is her country's most capped player of all time. The England centre, who spent 20 years wearing the letter C, can now add to it MBE. Where were you when you first found out and what was your reaction? Oh, I was actually in England camp. Um, I'd just finished my session for the day. I was about to meet one of my teammates, Chelsea. So I was on the street, opened the email, started crying immediately. She came out, thought something was really wrong. Um, but then we, yeah, we went out for a nice dinner to celebrate that night. It was a real shock and just really proud moment. And I just love playing for England. I love putting on that red dress and it just gives me tingles and I just never want it to stop. So I'm just gonna keep playing until they kick me out. The MBE will join Commonwealth Gold in a glorious medal collection, which might not be complete. With a World Cup to come this July, the road to South Africa begins with a training camp in Jade's native Manchester. She has the royal seal of approval, but that's nothing compared to the esteem in which Jade Clark is held by her fellow England Roses. Here at training, they've even incorporated a curtsy into the warmer. I've definitely had a few curtsies. I think they really enjoy doing it, so we'll, we'll just let the curtsies carry on a bit. But yeah, it's been really funny. They've, they've been really supportive of me. She's honestly incredible. Um, I've got a great memory of first coming into England and Jade was the first person that met me and, and said hello and welcomed me in. And she really drives the standards within the programme. It's an honour to play alongside her. And to coach her here on Jade's home turf. Jess Thurlby played for England at Manchester's Commonwealth Games in 2002. She's seen the sport explode in popularity since then and expects another surge this year as their World Cup begins in the same week as that of the Lionesses. A lot of the girls have met with Lionesses previously, so I think the relationships are really strong and collectively we're quite a strong powerhouse. So uh, I think let's just keep championing each other and each other's successes and we'll keep trying to take the learnings and be inspired by what we saw in the summer with the Lionesses as well. I'll let you go and do your curtsy. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> the deference could be the difference between England and Jamaica when around 4,000 fans in the AO arena will give the local hero a noisy homecoming in the first of a three test series. Are you ready for the reception you're going to get? They're going to go wild. Uh, I hope so. I'm a proud Partington girl. I had some nice messages on the community group and it's been six years since we played in Manchester. So it'll be really special to go out and wave to the crowd and like, just say thank you for supporting us. So yeah, it's going to be great. That Commonwealth gold inspired 100,000 people to take up netball in the UK. If Jade can recruit more by helping England win a World Cup, the curtsies will keep coming. Chris Hall, ITV News, Manchester. Yeah, well done to Jade on that MBE. What I'd like to know is, Mel, if you got an MBE, would you have everybody doing bows and curtsies in the office? No question. I would be demanding a red carpet. I knew it. I knew yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, no Mr question. Barham at home is curtsying all the time, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, here's Joe with the weather. <laughs> Why do I need a shower? I've been out in the rain. The faster you go, the sooner you'll be out. You'll save water too. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Thank you. A very good evening to you. Some blustery winds around today, especially along our coastline. It's felt quite cold. Tomorrow will feel a good deal milder, but we're due a spell of wet and windy weather, particularly for tomorrow morning. And then on Wednesday, it'll revert back to showers. Low pressure dominates our weather as we go through this week. A wet day tomorrow, showers midweek, and then on Thursday, more rain expected. And at times, accompanied by strong winds as we go through the next few days. Of course, rivers around the region are beginning to fill up now, and there's the risk of some localised flooding as we go through this week with further rainfall expected. Back to this evening, showers tending to sweep through and then die away for a time. Skies will clear, temperatures dip to around 4 or 5 Celsius. And into the early hours of Tuesday, winds swing round to a milder southerly or southwesterly. Cloud will build and we'll begin to see that rain moving up from the southwest before dawn. On to tomorrow, the sun is up at 8.25, setting at 4.12 tomorrow afternoon. 
I think we can expect a rather wet and windy rush hour tomorrow morning. Lots of water on the region's roads, gusty winds, very unpleasant conditions for much of the morning. And after lunch, an improvement, that rain pushing over the Pennines in a way, but leaving behind a low cloud, drizzle, bits and pieces of rain, mistiness and hill fog. It's a mild day though, 12 or 13 Celsius, but those gusty winds will continue to feature into tomorrow afternoon, particularly again up on higher ground and for our coastline. On Wednesday, expect a few showers. Thursday later on, rain will move in. And all through the week, temperatures around average or just above. Bye-bye. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Well, that's it from us for now. But if you are a Love Island fan, head to our website at itv.com slash Granada to check out the new lineup. An influencer from Liverpool and a teacher from Manchester are amongst the islanders heading to a brand new villa in South Africa. Very exciting. Are you a Love Island fan? Are you be well, watching there, it? there is a work WhatsApp group yeah. for Love Island. Which I'm not on <laughs> yet. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. See you. Goodbye. <laughs>